I'm so excited that we have Innovate Digital Solutions as a sponsor of HeCast this season. Innovate Digital Solutions provides anything that an office might need, hardware, software, IT, copy machines, things like that. They make an office run more smooth and they're really good at it. But one of the things that I love about Innovate, their founders, Andre and Katia Brasso, they're people that don't just believe it's important to build a strong business, but also to take that success and build the strong community around them. They really have a heart for what He Changed It is doing. People they love have gone through some of the stuff that we talk about on this show. Andre and Katia both believe that you can build a life worth living, and there are these evidence-based solutions that can help build that life. We're so excited to be in partnership with Innovate Digital Solutions, and He Changed It is better for it, and we hope you will be too. Go to innovate.ca and check them out. Welcome to HeCast, the official podcast of He Changed It. As always, I am Mike Chisholm. As always, I am excited to be here. And uh, I got to tell you, my excitement today has a little bit more juice to it, a little bit more um, intensity to it. Uh, not because uh, the guest, uh, this guest is better than any other guest or anything like that, but it's just because of the power and the and the, and the mood he brings to this. Oh, my gosh. Um Sven Erlinson is my guest today. Now, you may have heard of Sven Erlinson if if uh, he's the badass counselor. Badasscounseling.com. And if you haven't seen uh, or listened to any of his, uh, his 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 videos that are on social media, the badass counselor Sven is just that. And I mean, my word, uh, it, it, I, I the thing I love about this show is that he actually we start by going into Sven's history. So if you've ever wanted to know uh, where the badass counselor has come from and what has made him who he is, uh, boy, does he ever do a good job talking about his history, but then he goes into all sorts of great stuff, amazing tips for guys um, and how we can, um, you know, negotiate our life and, and find more success doing so. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's all looking inward. How can I be better? Yeah. Listen to this show. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of nuggets that are there that if we incorporate them into our lives and they're not difficult nuggets to incorporate. I mean, some of them going into your past. Okay. That might be a little bit more difficult, but you know what? Le putting tools in the tool belt learning how to be a good active listener, learning how to understand and, and identify with kids uh, more and, 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 and ways just to do it. Uh, Sven is just one of those guys. Now he's an author. There's a hole in my love cup is out. Uh, so is badass wisdom. And um, I just, I could not endorse Sven uh, more uh, in this conversation that we have here today. It is so good. I just, I just really, really hope that uh, you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed being a part of it. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, you know, one of the few guests who actually gets me to be able to shut up and I do, I, I shut up and I, I give, I give Sven a good listening to in this episode. It is a a wonderful, wonderful episode of HeCast. If you haven't downloaded the He Changed It app, uh, what the heck are you waiting for? Go to hechangedit.com and uh, download the app, whichever uh, technological device you have. We've got something for you. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank you so much for all the support you've given us so far. Uh, HeCast, the official podcast of He Changed It, is proud to present badass counselor himself, Sven Erlinson. <laughs> All right, Sven, I am stoked to have you here. Badass counseling right there, just as a soundbite is, uh, is, is, is something that, uh, jumps out at you. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, and, and then you see you and I'm really, really, really excited to learn about your story, um, your niche in mental health and what it is that you do. Sven, thank you so much for taking time out of your crazy schedule to be on HeCast today. Pleasure is completely mine, Mike, and I uh, appreciate what you are doing there with your show, and you're doing great work. Honor is mine to be here. Oh, man, I uh, that's a very sweet thing to say. Um, okay, so I'm not a huge Instagram guy. I, 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 I'm an old man, and, uh, and, and, and when it comes to social media, I learned Facebook back in the day, and that's kind of the one that I've sort of stuck with. So the moment I started seeing your Instagram videos um, immediately, immediately, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing. And, and it's so cool because I'm laughing and then suddenly the message hits of what it is that you're saying, the substance, you know, you're all steak and sizzle. The sizzle is there because of your presentation and how it's a badass counseling. Like that is a, uh, the, 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 the sizzle is everything, but then the steak starts settling in 
Hmm. Um, I want to know about you. I want to know about uh, how you got to where you are and uh, and, and and your journey. How, how long have you been a counselor, Sven? About 30 years. About 30, 30 years. years. And, yeah. And just regarding the steak and sizzle thing, uh, that's really nice. And I, I really wish you'd appreciate all the uh, or you'd uh, pass on to all the girls that ever turned me down that there was actually steak and sizzle because, boy, I got my heart broken. It sure would be nice if they would have known that, although it probably wasn't back then. But anyway, uh, well, got our journey start- develops into who we are now. Right. Like mm-hmm. and it's and it's all of those things that we go through that make us who we are now. And sometimes hard as it is, we got to go through that stuff to, to to get to that place. You know, the meat's got a cure. And um and, and I'm certain with you, uh, what, what brought you into counseling and what has evolved you to where you are now? Or did you start by going, no, you know what? I'm going to uh, have, a, have, a, have a real identity, um, a theme almost to, uh, to who I am and, and how I counsel people. Um, uh, well, a few things uh, just on your notion there of going through things to sort of cure the meat. There's an old quote by uh, T.S. Eliot, the, the writer, um, and uh, from poems, The Dry Salvages, and it's a bit of a paraphrase, but T.S. Eliot says, said that the grand mistake of life is to have the experience but miss the meanings. In other words, it's not enough simply to go through the hard times. Plenty of people can survive hard times and then will label themselves as survivor, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic, but to sure. be a survivor is an interim state. It's, a, it's an in-between but the ones who really wisen, the ones who really age, the wines that go from just old wines to brilliant old wines are the ones uh, as persons where they've gone into that pain and flushed out the parts that hurt and the longing that was never fulfilled and asked that pain as well, right. what it's trying to teach me, how it is trying to deepen me and, and broaden me and so forth. So just to sort of expand the point that you made there, did I uh, start this way? No. Um, I actually, coming out of uh, high school, I was going to the, I went to the Air Force Academy. I was studying to be a you know, fighter pilot, just like everybody else there. And Top Gun came out my freshman year at the Academy. And so we all had a big old heart on about this big, <laughs> all very excited. And I put in about two years there and uh, then I got out. It just my grades were fine. I was an intercollegiate athlete, football player, D1, and all this shit. Uh, it just, it didn't, I don't know. It just didn't, I, at the time, I said, I don't know why I'm leaving. I just know it's time to go. Well, that was my own soul talking. That was my own intuition talking. And I had parents who supported me uh, leaving, and uh, I just fucking did it. And then I got accepted to an Ivy League school, their business school, and um, I decided not to go there either because it didn't feel right. And one of my brothers who ended up making about a couple hundred million dollars in business, just retired a couple years ago. He was mad at me for a couple of months over that decision. He said, God damn it, Sven, if I would have had that opportunity, you yep. son of a bitch, you stupid son of a bitch. What are you yep. thinking? So anyway, but I, I, I followed my path and it, you got to understand I'm the youngest of six kids. My mother was a professional uh, spiritual counselor. My dad was a clergyman. So I grew up in a home where listening was a high priority, but they had six kids. By the time all my other siblings were gone from about 13 on, around the dinner table at night, what used to be eight people is now three people. And my mom, as she had, and dad, as, as they had taught us to garden and to take down trees and to change oil and, all, and use a table saw and all these things dad had taught and all the things mom had taught, mom always wanted a second girl, but she only got one and she had five boys, but she raised me as a girl. So I was raised to iron. I can sew with a, you know, cam sewing machines and, and we had to darn our own socks because my dad was a pastor. We didn't have money to always be buying new socks. So we had to learn how to darn the, the holes in our own socks and um, all these different things that mom taught, cooking and cleaning and all of these valuable things, which going into adulthood are tremendously valuable if you're ever going to be a bachelor. But the point is this. <laughs> so everybody's gone from the dinner table at evening. And I think mom thought, well, I'll just teach them more of what I know. And she yeah. began to teach me at the time. Uh, she was doing uh, counseling work, but she was also running a suicide prevention hotline. And so she began to teach me basic listening skills, active listening, passive listening. Okay, yeah. Sven, on, the, on what your father just said, what was the fundamental point that he was making? Now, deeper, what was he saying but not saying it? What was the point under the point, as she used to say? And so she was teaching me all these skills, and I just figured out oh, dinner conversation. Uh, what I didn't understand is that later then, after I had left the Air Force Academy, and went and got my degree in mathematics and uh, world religions. And that would morph into my uh, it, it desire to go into ministry. And I ended up becoming a Lutheran pastor. And while simultaneously sort of beginning a counseling practice, quite 
um, impromptu almost. I was using the skills and I didn't really even realize it or yeah. give a shit. They would and bleed so into and so, each other for sure. Yeah, they do, of course. Yeah. And uh, so then between the the being in ministry, but then I was also starting a speaking career. And so the speaking, and then I started writing. Well, my mother had started me journaling when I was 13 years old. I think she just saw it as a good sort of a spiritual tool. And my parents were very deeply spiritual, even if the religion, they sort of always took it with a grain of salt, even though dad was a pastor, and uh, which was great. And uh, so by then I had been journaling. By the time I'm 23, I'd already been journaling for 10 years. So I was already fluent in expressing my feelings and my thoughts and so forth. And the writing started, the counseling started, the speaking uh, started. And I was about 22, 23 when I realized I know exactly what I want to do with my life. And that was, I, all I want to do is the three things I love the most, speak, write, and counsel. I don't give a shit if I ever make a fucking dollar. And that cost me. It cost me a lot of friends. It cost me a wife. Uh, ended up later sort of costing me a second wife. Um, cost me a, a few family members for a long time who thought I was just being fucking irresponsible and so on and so forth. My career didn't begin to really, really congeal until my 40s. And, but I just believed in the work I was doing. I was writing so many fucking books. And no one was fucking reading them, barely. And, uh, and I didn't give a shit. It's just like, I'm living my life. I was working jobs to pay for you know, my life, my rent, but also to get my second wife so that she could have insurance. I worked a third job and all this stuff. But I was writing books and I was counseling and I wasn't uh, living any sort of high life. And then eventually, at one point, I just cashed it all in, gave away all of my world possessions, everything, drained my bank account. And I went and ministered to the homeless and lived among them, uh, and literally sleeping on the streets of Oakland, California for two and a half years of Oakland. ministering oh to the homeless. Yeah. Yeah. And, and insane madness, absolute yeah. madness. Yeah. But I did it cause it was what I felt called to do. You know, <laughs> by that point, you know, I'm in my early fucking forties. My parents, my mom was like, of course you're going to do that. Of course you are. I, I only get surprised Finn, when you act out of character. And so there I was going where the need at the time, as I saw it was the greatest bringing my skills there and not, coming in as someone trying to help them, but literally living as one of them. And so we'd drink together, we'd eat together, we'd talk, and, uh, and that was it. I was just trying to be a source of love in the world, you know, to those who were really in need. Um, and I, everybody has their things that speak to their heart, right? You know, some people it's clean air, some people it's horses, some people it's whatever. And for me, it's homelessness is, is a big issue for me. It just, for whatever reason, I just yeah. have such a soft spot for homeless people. Um, so anyway, it all just sort of unfolded and by my 30s i had already had a, a counseling practice a uh, more of a um addition in addition to the counseling but a uh sort of uh business consulting and not business consulting but the personal side of people who own their own companies or ceos so then when i finally moved like a coaching kind of deal yeah but it, what it was is it wasn't yes yes that would on the uh on the surface it appeared as that but what it really was it was counseling okay. and for people because ultimately, the, what, what's going to fuck people up, and, and now I'm in New York City, you know, and, and my clients are literally head of brokerages and heads in academia, professional athletes, all sorts of shit. And uh, invariably, what fucks them up is, isn't their work. I know nothing about their work. I don't claim to know anything about their work. I'm not here to help them, blah, blah, blah. I'm here because they have finally hit the pinnacle of their success and they're 42 years old. And in the, in the very year of their peak, their wife left them. I'm here because, you know, they're doing extraordinarily well. They are running, you know, global sourcing for blah, 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 or they own their own, um, you know, equity fund or whatever it is. And their 14 year old daughter absolutely hates their guts. I'm here because they've got, you know, the four homes, they've got the private jet, they've got everything. And they're so fucking empty inside. I'm here because, um, or, or, and not just the CEO types. I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't even begin to tell you. I did that brief stint at the Air Force Academy a couple of years. And since then, I couldn't even tell you that not just the military folk, but uh, special forces, police. Literally, one of my clients presently, when he was serving, was the top-ranked special forces operator in his entire branch of the U.S. military. I mean, absolute killers. Absolute killers on which my safety rests, yep. for which there is enormous gratitude. But invariably, it's always the same problem. Male or female, there is a universality to the human experience, and that is the longing to live 
who I really am, but people can't even hear who the fuck they really are. Yep. And we get so caught up in the messages we were taught as children, compounded by the messages we get from society saying, you know, buy into the American dream. And I'm all for the American dream. Sure. But then you get it or you reach the zenith of your career or you have, or even for I'm middle-class folk, I have poor folk, I have everything. Yep. Uh, clients over the decades, right? And it's just like, you don't have to be rich to experience that, that you bought into it and you got the things that are supposed to bring happiness. And it's, I still got this gaping fucking hole inside myself or I still want to blow my fucking brains out or my old man is still busting my balls yep. or my mom still thinks I'm worthless or my parents are still riding on my cocktails and I've hated them for 20 fucking years or yeah. I can't bring myself to say how angry I am at them. Yes. But deep down there, the, all the encoding, all of the messaging, it happened way back here. And when we are children, we are wet cement. Yes. And whatever the messages that we get are, be they explicit or more often implicit, those messages about your own worth, about your own value, about who you are, about what gives you value, those messages get pressed into the wet cement of, their, of your soul and they get jammed way the fuck down there. Mm -hmm. And those become the virus infecting the operating system for the rest of your motherfucking life. Yep. And we're not even aware of it. So my work then, and I move very, very quickly. I only work with people who are highly motivated to work. I don't care how old you are. I don't care yeah. what gender you are or non-binary. I don't care what fucking uh, social status you are. I don't care. I work very, very fast. We go very, very deep and I do very long sessions. Opening session with me is six hours and I require wow. an autobiogra autobiography before we even start. So I, yeah. I am fluent in your fucking life before we even start. And but it's, it's drilling down to that because invariably that is what's corrupting their life. And what happens is it begins to affect their business. So if I've got yeah. if I've got traders, you know, on the floors of the New York Stock Exchange or guys running the trading floors or guys running guys who are running whatever it is, yeah. Yeah. when they lose their edge or, or people, you know, who I've had several clients who uh, own hedge funds, run hedge funds with, you know, 30, 40 million um, AMI. Um, uh, Assets under me, AUM, and um, and they lose their edge. They they start questioning themselves, and invariably, it's not the work; it's the shit that's going on inside of them because they just got left by their girlfriend, or they just went home for fucking Thanksgiving, and their dad's fucking them up, or their own sense of imposter syndrome, or whatever. And it always, yeah. always, always, always tracks back to that shit. So the work you're doing is fantastic. Because you're trying to help men find themselves. We're trying to, you're trying to reduce the suicide rate and reduce the depression. And all of those invariably always, always, always track back to there. And so it's just helping them getting back to those origins quickly. Because as I tell my clients all the time, change, uh, transformation can be immediate if you go deep enough. So anyway, that's the quick primer on what I do. No, that's fantastic. And 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 uh, um, I wanted to let you preach because you're clearly a preacher. Uh, <laughs> but you have all these other things that are been put together. Looking back now, like knowing what it takes, and, and we hear some of them are buzzwords, some of them are are are, are just um you know uh, you know common sense. The things that your mom, I want to go back to, for a second, to the things that she taught you, active listening. Um, you use the word gratitude. Um, uh, and some of these, I probably some of these didn't, things. I probably didn't actually, I'm not a big believer in gratitude, but go ahead. You're oh man. Okay. Let's get into that. Cause that's a, I, I can't wait to hear your thoughts on that. But mm -hmm. some of these things that she taught you, um, mm -hmm. uh, no. And when you say gratitude, you said that, that you're feeling it for, for, for in, in the present, you didn't talk about gratitude back then, but I'm just saying some of these things that, that were taught into you that early, uh, boy, did, uh, did she ever do a job giving you some life skills and not even know it. Like, I mean, you think about how many people we come into contact with that have to learn yep. those types of skills so they yep. can negotiate their way through life. And you were given these skills uh, kind of out of the box, uh, the formative year stuff, um, but but at the same time still caused you static because the world that we live in here, you know, does entice us or, or encourage us to chase the things that you're talking about that you kind of repelled. Uh, were you always a rebellious spirit when it comes yeah, to certain things? Okay, very much so. And my kid, my parents had already had five kids, and by the time I came along, um, I think they'd sort of they realized how deliberate parenting doesn't necessarily mean more parenting. And I, I think we're seeing so much overparenting nowadays. And I don't just mean like, oh, kids nowadays are being coddled. No, parents nowadays are identi getting their identity from their children. My yes. children are everything. And and or um, 
well, whatever, not the point. There's enough bitching out there. Um, no, my mother actually, she uh, had her master's and she was an expert and taught at the graduate level. Later, after she had raised all of her kids, taught at the graduate level in the field of early childhood education. She knew what she was doing, both from having already written, now raised six kids by the time I'm up in teenage years. Uh, but also that was what her degree was in. And that's what her advanced degree and all of her life's work was in. And so my parents were very deliberate in that regard, but they had been seasoned by life itself. And so they had the experience. So she was teaching me things. Um, so anyway, they, they, by the time my mom even said, by the time we were forced, man, I couldn't handle you. And she was tired, but the, they had me at 40. So she's now, you know, 44, yep. Yep. you know, six kids in. Yep. And in a way that was the best blessing. I had the benefit of having some older siblings who sort of kept you in line, you know, you get, you know, knocked around a bit and, yep. you know, don't disrespect your dad or, or, you know, you know, quit being stupid, Sven, or, you know, the, the stupid shit siblings always give each other. And that was good. But ultimately I was given, and, and I was given liberty to do whatever the hell I wanted in terms of pursu pursuits and interests. And it was, it wasn't even encouraged. My parents, in, in all my older siblings, the one I told you who ended up making a couple hundred million by the end of his career, when he was in junior high and high school, he was in theater, but he was also one of the stars of the football team. Yeah. Uh, my sister, you know, every single one of us played musical instruments. Not so because you were all well-rounded like you are. Uh, all your siblings yeah, are. I, They were yeah. more well-rounded than me. They were more, far wow. more intelligent than me. Um, and But we all just played instruments, not because anybody told me. I had to. It's just, I don't know. My parents always, always had the stereo on in the house to Minnesota Public Radio, uh, member supported radio, and it was always classical music. Plus, I was in orchestra. I played the violin growing up then for six years, then switched over to the bass, and I had piano lessons. I was in theater literally all the way through elementary, junior high, high school. Um, oftentimes, you know, ma major roles or the starring role or whatever. Not because I was any good, but probably because there's nobody else they could find to, to do the job. But and sports, you know, I was a three sport athlete, played division one football and all that shit. And not my parents didn't give a shit. I swear to God, by, by the time I hit my sophomore year of, of high school, where I'm, you know, three sport athlete lettering in three sports, I, up to that point, my parents, I could count on one half of one hand, the number of athletic events my parents ever went to. And because I didn't play for my parents, I wasn't looking up in the sand saying, "Are my parents?" I didn't give a shit. I was. There I was going to ask if that created if that created anything or not. Oh, absolutely. And to this yeah. to this day, I mean, I was an NCAA strength coach for, for a number of years, and I would always tell my my athletes, "If you're looking up in the fucking stands, get off the fucking sideline. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Are you here to play the fucking game or see if your girlfriend or your mom or your dad is up there?" And with my own kids, I have a 32 year old and a 29 year old. My son was starting quarterback pretty much his whole life up until his senior year of high school, and. Uh, at which point they had brought in a ringer that they had all grown up with who was going to a private school. They brought him back to the public school, and he's now uh, the captain of the uh, New, New York Islanders. So he was just a cut above athlete-wise. Nobody could keep up with him. Oh, yeah. And uh -huh. uh, But anyway, not the point. My son was like, no. athlete. I deliberately, willfully did not go to all of my son's games. I never went to his practices. Um, I just don't believe in that shit. It's like, if you're playing, you're playing because you love the game. If you don't love the game, you have my permission to quit. I don't care if it's the first fucking week of practice. If you start something, you do not have to finish it. The second you know, not the second you have a bad day, but the second you know you don't want to play that fucking game, you quit. The second you're in something and you know it, you know it inside of you that this sucks, this blows anus, I don't want to be here, get the fuck out. You're wasting your time. I do not believe in finishing just to say I fucking finished. Fuck that shit. Right. Life, you could be, my son could have been fucking paralyzed a week later. I want his last week. Not to be playing a goddamn sport he doesn't want to fucking play. I want his last week to be he's just out fucking riding his bike around, watching Tom and Jerry. I, I don't give a fuck. Well, now my son's 32. Yep. Has a very respectable career working for one of literally the top academic and athletic universities in the United States yep. in their athletic department. He owns a home, tax bank citizen, putting his wife through veterinary school. He's successful. My daughter, uber successful and also works for me. I just, I don't know. I just saw life differently. It's like, don't fucking waste your time. Because every single person that I deal with has wasted so many fucking years listening to these arbitrary rules of, oh, finish what you start. And, you know, uh, men this and women. Fuck that shit, man. Yeah, just yeah. be who the fuck you are. So my, my stepdaughter, wonderful. Both my stepdaughters are just wonderful uh, young women, 33 and 24. And the 24-year-old, she's been dating a guy who is, he plays like, 15 fucking instruments, uber talented kid. He's 30, 29, 30. Yeah. 
Yeah. And he, he wanted to, both of his parents are educators. He wanted to drop out of high school when he was in high school. All right. Obviously. Um, and they <laughs> said, if that's what your heart's calling you to do, do it. He got accepted to Juilliard, turned that down. And he's been making this life and he lives the poor fucking life of a musician who hasn't made it. And I have so much respect for that kid. So much because that's the shit I did. That's somebody who's fucking on fire. Are you doing yeah. it because you love it? Or are you doing it just because, you know, you think you should and blah, blah, blah. And everybody's got choices to make. You make your own fucking choices. Mm -hmm. But do you believe in the motherfucking path that yeah. you are on? Do you believe it? Does it inspire you? Do you get out of bed every day? Even though you're in six months of a hard slog, it's like there's no other thing I'd rather be doing. It's like that old saying, a bad day of work is still, or a bad day of fishing is still better than a good day at work. In other words, yes. if you love what you're doing, you're going to go through. You accept the hard times. I'm not quitting because it's hard. I'm quitting. When I quit, it's just because I don't feel passion for this work anymore. And everybody quits. Anyway, go ahead. What's so, your No, question? no, no. I, I want to talk about that that part, yeah. point there because um, I think that that is a, uh, a scale that is constantly out of balance for parents when it comes to their kids or even themselves in life. You talk about the idea of if it's not resonating, if it's not harmonious, quit. It's yeah. not for you. Uh, don't go in the direction that you're not supposed to go in. And what of one of life's gifts uh, to you uh, early on was learning the fact that 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 you know what you weren't resonating with. Yes, this is really cool, and everybody around us says, "Oh, this is the thing to go to." Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 a high honor. It's all of these mm -hmm. all this crap that you're talking about, uh, but it didn't it didn't get you down here. That's okay. right. Okay. Now, what's the difference, though, when we have kids or are ourselves know that we are trying to do something hard to stretch, to be better, to be bigger, to per learn perseverance and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And you have a bad day doing something that you do sometimes find joy in, but sometimes uh, the, the tank is empty. Right. And, and, and so how do you know the difference whether uh, to quit and move in a different direction or to keep yeah. going? I think that's great. Well, I, with my own kids. And uh, I simply say, do you want to quit? You're going to have hard days no matter what you choose. You're to, and you are yeah. welcome to quit anytime. Do you want to quit? You give them the option because I very much believe that you, hard work doesn't have to be taught. I believe my kids had chores. My yeah. kids had rules. In fact, my nephews used to come over and say, Uncle Sven, I'm telling my mom. I said, okay. Um, and uh, oh, for what? Because you have so many rules at your house. I do. I said, I do. But we all, you're going to have more rules, but you're also going to have more fun. You know, because it's just like, you know, if you're sitting at the table, you don't eat with your fucking fingers. All right. You don't fucking, you know, I just want some sense of decorum. Right. And, you know, I was raised with good manners, shit like that. But the bottom line is, I believe that when people are doing what they love, that hard work comes naturally. So yes. if you're not working, busting yeah. your balls at something, it's because you don't want it. You don't fucking want it. Or, or, and this is a separate issue. You've got so many, so much negative messaging from your own past bogging you down so much that you know what you want to do, but you can't muster the energy either to start or to sustain the effort. So you stop, start, stop, start. And that's from you're still being bogged down by whether it's mom shit, dad shit, whatever it might be from back there. But generally speaking, excuse me, I apologize. Mm -hmm. no. Generally speaking, um, people know how to hard, know how to hard, uh, know how to work hard. I've got uh, several clients, many clients actually in the cattle industry and in ranching and in farming uh, who have done extraordinarily well in their careers. And, or sometimes they'll send their, you know, 20 year old daughter to me who's really struggling with blah, blah, blah. And you want to talk about a motherfucking work ethic, but the, in a lot of cases or in most cases, and that's just one field, right? Ranching yep. cattle. In most cases, those kids shoot, they're working harder at 14 than most people know in their entire life, yeah. but they're doing it for love of the work. Yeah. Most of them. They're doing it for the love of the work. So I don't really believe a work ethic has to be taught per se. Now, if the family is out raking the yard or if I'm out raking the yard, you know, you got chores, get your ass out here, let's go. Yeah, and it's yeah. just, and they need that. They need to learn that. But as far as, you know, finding their passions, if I help my kid just not even find their passion, just let them quit. Let them quit a thousand fucking times if that, mm -hmm. because when they find that one or two or three things that they're passionate about, they will naturally engage. And I used to tell, when I used to speak to, you know, athletes and still when I speak to athlete groups, athletes in particular, because they'll know the reference, but I'll tell them first thing out of my mouth will be Lombardi was wrong. Vince Lombardi was so wrong on one thing. Granted, he coached the most heinous football team in all of the NFL. Being a Minnesota Vikings fan, he was a Packers coach. And so I have no time for Vince Lombardi. But that aside, <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, I'll get more Packer hate, but fuck him. Um, anyway, um, but when he said winners never quit and quitters never win, it's just bullshit. 
It's just bullshit. The smartest people are constantly quitting. And as to reference my point, I will ask, you know, whatever group I'm speaking to, I will ask as one point of reference, what was Michael Jordan's Major League Baseball batting average? Now, everyone knows that the greatest or one of the greatest basketball players of all time transitioned into baseball. He was going to try to make the two, he was going to be a two sport guy, yep. such as Bo Jackson and Neon, uh, Dion Neon Sanders, Dion yeah. and, and yeah. right. And then, of course, NBA, NFL was Bud Grant, the Minnesota Vikings coach. He was the first person to ever have done that NFL and NBA playing for the old Minneapolis Lakers, which is now Los Angeles took our team. But anyway, um, <laughs> but anyway, people say, oh, and there will be people who will actually shout out. It was 260 or 226, whatever the fuck. Yeah. And I'll say no. And they'll be like, yeah, it was. And I'm, they'll be Googling. It says it right here. And I'll say no. You're fucking wrong. And they'll be like, who is this dumbass? And I'll say the truth is. Michael Jordan never had a major league baseball batting average. Yeah. Michael Jordan never made it out of the double A's. Yeah. He never made it even to triple A ball. He yeah. wasn't good enough. And he quit. Wayne Gretzky, arguably the greatest hockey player of all time, except for maybe Gordy Howe. He, what did he do as a coach? He's coaching the Coyotes for yeah. five years. And he has basically a five or six years, whatever it was. He has a 500 record and he mm -hmm. quit. Yep. That's right. So either either A, you quit because you don't enjoy it, your heart's not in it, or you're not good enough, whatever it is, smart people are constantly quitting. Constantly quitting. And especially when we're young, the kid has to have the liberty to step up to that giant buffet of life yep. and to taste and quit as many things as possible. Okay, so one of the skills that your mom uh, and, and, and dad and your environment and your situation, uh, your demographic, poured into you clearly early 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 on was mindfulness this is one of those another one of those buzzwords that we have today is, is, is it's out there and people are actually and it's good we need to be mindful we need to be present we need to to get out of the autopilot and 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 look at what we're doing and actually have active uh, analyzation of what it is that we're doing okay so you were taught that clearly very very early now, I think what we're talking about here, uh, if we're a parent or we're looking at our situation uh, and where we're at, stop confusing. The kid is good at something, so I need to push them to continue oh, doing God, it. No. But just because Jesus. they're good at it, and that's, I think that that's where part of the confusion lies, though, yeah. because they see that they're good at it or we feel that we're good at something. Yep. But that does not necessarily mean that we're passionate about it. And there's an introspective level of work that needs to be done to analyze that, to, to, to know the difference. But I don't know that we necessarily know the difference in this society. Well, and worse, worse, making it even more insidious, Mike, is that a child wants nothing more, literally nothing on God's green earth, would sacrifice even food, shelter, safety, for the approval, the love of a parent, mm. the acceptance of a parent. So if a child is only, and this is a huge thing in my work because I generally work with extra, extraordinarily high performers who invariably, almost without exception, got the message in childhood that your worth is tied up not in your being, but in your doing. Yes. And we as men have always been enculturated that your worth, a man is what he does and a woman is what she looks like. And hopefully we're blowing the shit out of both of those, okay? Yeah. But yeah. the bottom line is this, excuse me, the bottom line is this then, that if that child has something they're, they're good at and finally my old man notices me or I got, I actually got, for my giant love cup, and I've never gotten love from mom or dad, I got a little fucking teaspoon of fucking yeah. love poured in there because I was, I got a perfect, right? I was up in front and I made them proud. Because I did and well I told my own children, or on the field oh, or whatever. Oh, my anything, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, and yeah. I, I told my children from a very young age, if you are focused on making your mother, and we were divorced that uh, by that time, but we could work together on the meta issues. And I sort of did the meta and she did the micro, whatever, even as exes. But we both agreed on this. I said to my kids, if you are trying to make me proud, you have already taken your eye off the ball. You do oh, not man. exist to make me proud. If you are worried about making me proud, then you're being a damn fool because you, I am already proud of you. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. You are my daughter in whom I am well pleased. You do not exist. Do not waste your time. There's Yes, if you go to jail or flash children in the park or sell drugs, yeah, I'm going to be pissed. I'll still love you. But mm -hmm. I'm gonna be fucking living and I'm not mm -hmm. gonna be proud of you, but I don't really think that's on the table. I really don't think you're gonna do that. So just focus on what brings you joy. 
you're focused on making me proud. And I, and that was hard. Let me tell you. Yeah. So they I, brought yeah, in, I can so imagine. they brought in my son's senior year. They brought in this kid who would be the captain of New York Islanders, a- Anders Lee. Right. I just, uh, just, they, they're just certain athletes that are just a cut above everyone, yep. even when they're not trying, but then if they have the work ethic, well, they'd bring them in. And so my son, they moved him over to strong safety, which he had played for years. Um, and, uh, but then on third down, sometimes they'd pull my son and put Anders in there and I'd be pissed. It's like, what the fuck is with that coach? That's my son's position. And I, a party is like, you feel bad for your kid. And it's just like, you want to be proud of your kid, but then your kids, your kids on the bench, whatever. But I and always protect felt, there's protection there too. Well, yeah. But then uh, the other side of me knows two things. One, if that coach's fucking ability to put food on his table for his kids depends on his win losses, he has every right to bench my fucking sure. kid. Every fucking right. Anyway, the point is, it's hard to swallow our pride sometimes. It's hard to let go of my own ego as the parent and it being sewn up in the kid or my own fucking agenda for them. And it's so easy. It is so fucking easy to manipulate a child. So easy. Or to manipulate a teenager. Um, I had one guy. He was a, he was, came to us 17 years old. He ended up going to uh, one of the military academies, one of the service academies. Mm-hmm. As I did, he went to a different one. But uh, he comes to a senior year of high school, and he had an academic full-ride scholarship basically to Harvard, mm-hmm. basically to study English literature, write poetry, shit like that. And then he had an opportunity to go to, I think it was Naval Academy, whatever it is, and play sports. And, uh, and his mom had passed away years ago, and he was raised by his father. And uh, his father, you know, the kid was just on the fence. I can't decide, I can't decide. The father steps in and says, you know, okay, you're going to go to the academy. I'm deciding you're going to the academy. All right. Mm-hmm. The, the grand mistake in all of that is, A, if the father has made, that is the single biggest decision of that child's life up to that point, indisputably. And the father steps in and makes the biggest decision of his life, which indicates if the father's going to do it with the biggest decision of his life, then yeah. in all likelihood, the father has already been doing it with medium and small decisions, which means this kid hasn't been able to hear his own fucking voice for 17 motherfucking years. I now know him in his 50s, and he still can't hear his voice. He's had a great career, but he still struggles with that. And we've had to work together to get him down to that voice. But the point is the parent wanted to be proud of the child and the parent chose the path that would make me as the father more proud that I had my own agenda. And the father was very, very subtle. And I love you, son. And I just really think it'd be best for you. And I think this is the best decision. It's like, fuck you. Who fucking cares what you think, old man? Can the child, are you helping the child hear their own voice? Because what makes them happy or them most proud of their own life, be it today, four years from now, or 40 years from now, can only be determined by their voice. Now, parents have the best of intentions, but it's always so easy to let our own ego, our own wants, our own fears infuse their decision. It's so easy. And so, yeah, there's so much an effort when parenting to, to letting go. And this is why I tell people all the time that one of the grand mistakes is if, if we think of each child as being, and, and I know this is silly, but being implanted with a computer chip when yeah. they're born yeah. and written into that is the code of who you are. What color will be your favorite color when you're four? What color will be your favorite color when you're 50? Yeah. My cult favorite color used to be purple because of the Minnesota Vikings. Then uh, it was Kelly green for most of my life. And now it's Kelly green and orange. And it's a dumb little thing but it's the colors I fucking like. Yeah. Fuck you. These are my colors or you know what, what you'll be good at. I'm good at gardening. Do I enjoy it? No, I hate weeding gardens, but my parents taught me how to garden. They'd grown up on giant farms during the great depression and world war two, but it enables me to, you know, make a pretty gardens for my girlfriend who loves, you know, dragonflies and hummingbirds and things like that. I like hummingbirds too, but anyway, the point <laughs> is, the point is the smart, when children are young, to some degree, we have to wire them into our chip, my values, Yes. Uh, manners. Uh, I yep. just think it's really important for my daughter to know how to change a tire and, yeah. and change her own oil. And, or I, I want my sons to, you know, be respectful and, and know how to, ch- okay, those are, I'm teaching them my values. And that's yeah. important. That is important. But, but, but it's so much fun living more than one life. It's so much fun to be worshipped. It's so much fun to have the mini me, which is a heinous idea. And I have an article on my on my website about emotional incest and that whole mini me, best child is best friend bullshit. Anyway, the point is this: the task, especially by pre-puberty, but some started earlier, but far too many many start it late or never do it. And that is to dewire the child from my chip and bit by bit in manageable bites, rewiring them into their own chip. Because the task of parenting, 
is not just to serve and protect your child. It's not just to give them a happy child. It's to prepare them for adulthood. And if you are not teaching them how to hear their own voice and to make decisions based on their own voice and to fall flat on their mother fucking face and grieve and lick their wounds and when they're ready, stand up and begin life again. If you don't teach them that now, they're going to get a giant ass kicking by okay. life when they're in their 20s or 40s. Go ahead. So you just named two things that are uh, extremely difficult. Very, again, we, we've been talking a little bit. It's been a bit of a theme. Uh, they're simple and then there's easy. Those aren't the same things necessarily. But what you just said is actually very simple. And, 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 uh, you know, and, and being mindful about it. Okay, awesome. Now, now, obviously, the first step would be awareness. Okay, I'm aware now that I might be taking parts of my chip and putting it into my kid for whatever reasons. And you're right. Like there's also, and, and then there's another ingredient there, how much many parents, most parents, if not all love their kids so much. And the idea of having that bond would be just, Oh, tremendous. But then suddenly the cold shower of awareness hits us. And it's like, Oh, you're screwing the kid up by doing that. You're, you're causing them work that they're going to have to do later in life to deprogram so they yep. can figure out who they are and move forward. Okay, great. I'm on board. I understand that. Holy, I don't want that for them because I do love them that much. So what do I do? Is it one of those things where the awareness and the mindfulness, you just kind of look for those little moments throughout uh, throughout the childhood as they're growing to say, okay, oh, this is what I want, but why do I want it? Okay, no, I want it for them because of this. Uh, I am I am trying to get them to, to learn the basic skill to, to, to change a tire or, or, or have the manners at the table. And it's important to have that structure. Uh, or it's because... It's because I want to make sure that uh, I know that my little girl has a mechanic skill because that'd be really fun and very cool. And that's because it's going to serve my ego. Is it just that or are there actual concrete tips that we could actually do to? Uh, yes, great, to try and great protect? question. Yeah. That is that is the exact right question, Mike. You nailed it. Uh, so three points right within there. One, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, awareness. Um, it's a very Buddhist concept. I'm not Buddhist, but I'll fucking steal from anybody. Sure. And that really life begins at the moment of awareness and not just aware of what's really going on around me, but more importantly, what's really going on inside of me. What's yeah. the real reason I am getting angry right now? What's the real reason I'm questioning my child on this particular decision? What's really going on? But the thing is, the thing is, and this is point number two, you will never, ever reach awareness if you are so congested, occluded with all of the messaging from your own childhood. And this is why I tell parents all the time, nothing, nothing, nothing will transform your parenting more than having the courage to go in and clean out your fucking childhood shit. Because whether you believe it or not, whether you see it or not, in all likelihood you don't, it is not only infusing and infecting, but often outright driving your parenting uh, of your children, your parenting mistakes, you are making so many mistakes that you, by your own reckoning, not by my reckoning, who gives a fuck what I think, yeah. by your own reckoning, that if we were to get all of that stuff out, you would look at how you've been parenting. You'd be like, oh, fucking Jesus, God, what have I been doing? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the the, the action step to on, on the practical level is to begin the process of going into that. Well, it's like, well, what the fuck does that even mean? Yeah. Does that mean kumbaya shit with my feelings? And but yeah, it actually does. Yep. It, that's actually exactly what it means. And and the truth is, how do you do that? And that's what I've written my books for. You know, there's a hole in my love cup and and so forth as a process to step you through that. A step by step way to step you through that. And a lot of most, I don't know, whatever, a lot of people, a lot of therapists, a lot of clergy don't know how to do that, to go down deep enough. Because if you don't do that, that shit is still driving the equation of your life. Third point there, and that is one of the really the, the, the themes that the parent has to be aware of. And I just pound, pound, pound this point. And I am merciless on this point. If this is your child and this is you, mm -hmm. this is the most important thing of all parenting. If you get nothing else other than go back and fix your own shit yep. and heal and flush out all the pain, the fears, and the bullshit beliefs you were talking about to yourself. Other than that, this is the most important thing. The child does not exist to pour love into your love cup and meet your needs. The parent exists to pour love into and to meet the needs of the child. If you in any way, at any time, invert that equation, you are damaging that child. And as the chefs used to tell me, all the years I worked in, you know, paying my bills, working in the hospitality industry and restaurants and serving and bartending and shit, 
in those rare times, we'd always go out drinking, but in the rare times the chefs would come with, they'd always say, Sven, on any given night, even a master chef can fuck up a recipe. Mm -hmm. Even a master chef can fuck it up, which is why what makes the great restaurants great, because they fuck it up so few, so uh, seldom. But if that recipe, then, that dish that I just fucked up coming off of my lines, fan, if that lands in front of the person who has the biggest mouth in town or the woman who is the LA Times food critic, critic that will have long-term negative ramifications for my restaurant indisputably. And, and that's because some recipes, some ingredients are so volatile, so sensitive that it requires an exquisite touch and perfect, perfect focus. Yep. Children are infinitely more sensitive, infinitely more volatile, infinitely more temperamental than even the most sensitive uh, I've had athletes, Olympic figure skaters, and even the most uh, sensitive, delicate Olympic figure skating routine. And we all know what, is, what a powerfully precise yep. uh, sport that or balance beam and gymnastic or uh, recipe. Yes. Children are, and so it requires such deliberateness and such care. And you're going to fuck up anyway. You are, but you're going to radically reduce the, the nature of your fuck ups. You're going to catch them quicker. You're going to be willing to apologize for what you've done, which so many parents don't do wrong. And, and so you're going to be less likely to depend on this child to meet your own fucking emotional needs that you never got fucking fulfilled back there. So you're using the child. I had a woman that I was dating in my early 20s, and I knew it then. Even in my 20s, early 20s, a fucking yeah. knucklehead that I was, this woman said this. And I'm like, okay, this is so wrong. Of course, I'd been raised by who I'd been raised by. But this woman said, I want to have children so that I'll have someone who will love me forever. And I'm like, what the actual fuck yeah. just came out of your mouth? You want children to meet your emotional needs forever. It's like, yeah. oh, my God, I just bleed for whoever, you know, fucking for your children come out of your vagina. Because that's just what a horrible burden to put on a child. If they're responsible, yeah. if you ever happen, fuck that shit. Anyway. So, OK. Um, now, that being said, there are going to be guys who hear this message and they're going to have kids where the cement isn't dry yet. But 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 they've been uh, making patterns in it already <laughs> uh -huh. and 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 so um now uh, hopefully this message will be a hard stop god sven i'm i'm commanding you are coming back on the show again at some point because i i mean you know we went down this path today there are so many paths and i cannot i cannot um endorse uh if if, if you like what sven is saying here i cannot endorse uh, his Instagram and, and, and his messaging that he puts out there uh, enough because it's on every subject that you could think of. And, and, and this is, this is one that we've gone into, but I think it's a really important one. And there are no coincidences. I, I fully believe that, uh, that, that, that we went down a parenting path today because there are guys who are going to hear this message today that are, are, are the show today uh, where their kids cement is still wet. And, yeah. And and they're now suddenly the idiot light on the dash just started going off hearing what you're saying Holy crap! I have been doing that. I have been, you know, um, 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 you know, taking the love that we do receive from our kids and how good it makes us feel like a drug. I've been, I've been, I've been out of balance. I've been, I've been doing it wrong, or I've been doing it too much, or I haven't, yeah. I haven't focused enough on going the other way. I want to yeah. focus on doing that. If we know the cement is still wet, but 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 we want to change course. Mm -hmm. Um, you said one of the things you just said is apologize. Learn how to be mm -hmm. humble yourself mm -hmm. for your kids. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, learn how to say, you know, we're not perfect and, 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 yeah. and, and, and what you want is important. Uh, please know that like, like, like be, uh, be blunt with them. I mean, they're, they're you know, we, yeah. I, I loved Mr. Rogers. And the reason oh, I loved Mr. Rogers yeah. was because Mr. Rogers used to communicate with kids. Like he would talk to adults. He would just try and simplify it as much as yeah. he possibly could. Yeah. I remember there was one episode where he actually defined assassination. He defined assassination. Wow. To kids on wow. a kid's show. Wow. You know, what does assassination sure. mean? Like, like, and and, right. and 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 to me, I go back and what you're talking about here, see it harkens that uh, that image to me because it's like, okay, they're kids, but that yeah. doesn't mean we have to treat them like they're stupid. It, it means right. we treat them like they're kids. Right. And 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 um, so what are what are some ways when the with the cement is still wet that we can reverse course and some easy yeah. ways to start again? Mindfulness again goes yeah. back to, to yep. uh, recognizing it. Yeah. Uh, that's number one. Um, when you talk about also, and I appreciate the other message that you talked about, you know, mm -hmm. the airplane analogy, right? Mm -hmm. If, if the cabin depressurizes, cause you're in one of them Boeing ones, whatever mm -hmm. cabin depressurizes mm -hmm. and the masks fall down, mm 
You right. don't put the kid's mask on first, even right. though you care for the kids so much, right. you put yours on first. And that's, right. that's to go back to that message about, okay, we got our own stuff to work on, work on your own stuff. That'll yeah. serve your kids that much better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's great. But yeah. in our daily interactions with our kids, with yeah. the wet cement, what are some ways that we can do that? A couple of things. And even if your kid's cement has already dried, say by teen years, it is never too fucking late to humble yourself, put your tail between your legs. And before you even go back to your child, to especially in teens and 20s and 30s and 40s to make a list of everything you think you have ever done to hurt your child and if you can't fucking do that then you're not ready to go back because you're not humble enough yet life hasn't beaten you down enough with your own pain and your own guilt and so on and so forth um but you there's never it's never too late to not just apologize but to own it and to begin to really fuck and change your ways and humble yourself before the child and, and to feel true contrition. Contrition is a beautiful thing. God damn, it's a painful thing. But it's a it's a beautiful thing when you have, when it has occurred to you the damage that you have done in your life, whether to your child, to your spouse, to your ex-spouse, to a dear friend, to a child, whatever. Okay. But to answer your question, one of the biggest things, other than being deliberate about going into your past and and healing that, um, slow the fuck down. I had a I have a dad, and I love this guy. I love this guy so much. And uh, he has uh, uh, four kids and two of them are daughters and his daughters are under the age of like four. And we were in a, you know, a session and uh, he says, Sven, I think I had a breakthrough this week. I said, what's that? He says, you know, I was bathing both my daughters. I have them in the rub-a-dub-dub in the tub and one, or no, I had one in the tub and the other one didn't want to go in, didn't want to take a bath. And I'm like, fuck, man, it's bedtime. I've got to do this. Plus, I have yeah. to get in an extra hour, cut a couple hours of work after I put the girls to bed. But I want to read them a story because I love reading story time. And it's just, and I'm just thinking to myself, I'll just call the daughter Angela for lack of a better. Sure. Uh, I just wish Angela would get in the fucking tub. And I'm, I can feel myself getting worked up. And Sven, I saw it. I saw myself getting worked up. And I, I, I had like this fucking holy shit moment. And I saw that I'm the problem right now. Yes, she's not doing what I want, but something's going on in her. Sven, I, I don't know how, what the fuck, it's our shit. I was aware, I've been getting the shit out, so I was able to be present to her, and I just stopped, and I said, Angela, sweetheart, what's going on? And she started crying. Oh, you know, Billy at preschool, or, you know, at dinner, I wanted more dinner, or whatever the fuck the reason was, right? But it was important to her. Yeah. And after I listened and and I looked her in the eye and I was sort of stroking her shoulder while she was talking and holding her hand, she got it all out. And I just said, sweetheart, that I can understand why you're upset. Of course you're upset. That makes total sense. And I'm sorry. She started crying and I hugged her and she said, I think I want to take a bath now, daddy. And she climbed into the bathtub and all he had to do, what do we all want? As my mother so wisely said, she used to tell me this when I was a teenager. I don't know why you tell the teenager what the method is that you're employing, but she said, Sven, always remember. And I use this with fucking adults. I use this <laughs> in sex therapy with clients. I use it when working with military folk, with fucking business. And it, so it's not just to children, but mom was a, a children's specialist. And so she said, Sven, always remember children want to be heard, not fixed. Yeah heard not what is our default because yes. our child is whether especially in teen years 20 years because they're experiencing agitation because billy just left me or because i don't know what path to choose or whatever the child is agitated the child is worked up from their emotions and we start to get worked up uh and my own anxiety starts to suffocate me yeah. so i control things outside of me to control my own anxiety boom problem I'm now controlling, ex well, that's my own shit. Yeah. I can't deal with my anxiety, so I'm going to control other people, especially my kids, because they're so easy to control. Yes. Right. And so the more we remove the original drivers of that anxiety or of that fear, which is, oh, my own fears of judgment because of blah, blah, blah. Anyway, then I stop trying to fix, and then I'm able to just fucking be present. I'm able to slow myself the fuck down. It's yeah. not just about slowing down. It's having the ability to slow down because I remove the things out from outside of me that are keeping me going fast and always yeah. busy. So yeah. he had done the work. He was able to slow down. He was able to be present, and he was able to be listened because there's nothing, nothing that a person wants more, or this is certainly in the top three. There's nothing a person wants more than, well, in the words of that great movie, Avatar, 
They don't use the words, I love you. They no. use the words, I see you. I see you. And what does that mean? We all long to be seen for who we really are yeah. and appreciated, accepted, approved of, loved for who we really are. Yes. To be seen and the person stays. It's never more true than with the child. Of course, as in adulthood, what we learn is that in order to be seen and loved for who we are, I have to have the courage to show who I really am. But if I've been shamed for who I really am or told that who you are doesn't matter by a parent, I'm not going to show you right. Okay, but the point is, that daughter in that moment, Angela just wants to feel heard. She wants to feel understood. She wants to feel seen. And you know what happens to our anxieties when we feel heard, truly listened to, and and seen? All of those anxieties inside of us go. They evaporate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they that's just exactly have right. Yep. So yep. At, at the very least, yes, it's working on your own self ship, but slow the fuck down. Get down on the child's level. Uh, listen to your child. Truly listen and be present. And if you do nothing else, you, you want to make your child feel heard. Just repeat the, back the exact same words they just said. Remove your desire to fix out of the equation more often than not. There will be times when your child says, I need help figuring this out. And then don't tell them what to do. Then you ask them things like, what feels right? What do you most want to do? What are you most afraid to do? Always ask the fear question. Always, always, always. Fear is almost always driving the equation. If they can identify their fears, then they can determine if they want to do it anyway or not do it. And ask them things like, what's the hardest part? So what's the hardest part? Mm -hmm. What's the scariest part? What are you feeling right now? And then when they say, oh, I'm feeling really uncertain, and just say this, wow, I can really understand that. I can understand why you feel uncertain. Let them have their feelings. Don't try to steal their feelings by saying, no, you shouldn't feel uncertain. No, you shouldn't feel sad. You should, and try to put some happy spin. That doesn't make their fear, their sadness go away. Yeah, They're just now putting on a veneer because it's yeah. what you fucking want. Yeah. Just let them have it. And the more they're able to just flush that shit out, they can operate from a sense of peace and knowing their own voice and a more suppleness to life. But otherwise, they're just trying to fucking please you. They will just do whatever the fuck you tell them to do. And you don't know what's best because you don't know. You cannot know what their voice inside of them is speaking to them. And the sooner you start that and helping them trust their voice. And if you want to learn a, a quick tip with children, yeah. think, the three, what I believe, three of the most powerful phrases you can ever say to a child. One, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. While you're hugging them and just letting them, so they need that safety. Two, mm -hmm. You're doing just fine. You're doing fine. Even if they make a mistake, even if they're struggling, or even if they just stumbled and fucked up, you know, you're doing just fine. It's going to be okay. They need to know that I had parents who were 40 years old when they had me. So that by the time I'm a teenager, they're in their mid fifties and they've had six kids. They're wise old fuckers and they were slow. They didn't get worked up about every little thing that got me worked yeah. up. It was very often. Um, it'll be okay. You're going to, you're doing just fine. Sven. And then the third thing, and I believe actually, especially with teenagers, this is one of the most powerful messages that they can get from a, a parent. And it's simply this, even when they fuck up, even when they've trusted their own voice and maybe they lost, or maybe they made a mistake or whatever is to reassure them with this saying, you make good decisions. You make good decisions. It's all right. You make good decisions. Don't stop trusting your decisions. Because even when I'm trusting my own voice, I still have things that sometimes go awry just because a life interferes or another person is involved. It doesn't mean that that was a bad decision. It just means you don't, out, nobody gets to always win. Yes. Even when you're trusting your own voice and that yes. those pains are intended to teach and, and expand and deepen us. But for a child to be reassured that trusting their own voice is good, Rather than the parent now interjecting myself and saying, well, you should have, or next time maybe you should do more of this, but just saying, and if you get, again, if you get their angsty feelings out of them, they'll hear their own voice and teaching them to trust that. Why? Why? So that when they're 23 years old and they've moved across the country for their first job in San Diego or in Boston, and now they've got all these forces, society and new Boston, da, 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 they can still yeah. hear their voice. Why? Because they've gotten the reps. For the last 10 years, trusting their voice, failing, trusting their voice, succeeding, trusting their voice, trusting their voice. They've got a sense of groundedness and they don't always need to call up and say, mom, what should I do? Dad, what should I do? Dad, tell me what to do. Or yeah. boyfriend, boyfriend, tell me what to do. Tell me well, what to do. And yeah, this is the last point. This is, yes. Well, this is my last point. And that is you are doing your child a disservice by constantly telling them what to do. Why? Because yes. what you're fundamentally training that person, just yes. like a dog, just like a colt, you are training that person to always forever be tuned into an external power source. So even if that external power source is no longer you and now it's their spouse or now it's their boyfriend when they're living in San Diego, they're always going to be looking outside of themselves for what to do. And you may think that all feels good and cozy as the parent, but it doesn't. You're fucking up the kid because they're doing what you want rather than being who they are. And they're, and they're going to come to 40 fucking years old and they're going to be miserable as fuck because yes. they've never been given permission to live their own life, but worse. 
worse. They're going to walk right into relationships where they abdicate their power to their partner yep. and now their partner controls them. And it's yeah, not that you, you married a narcissist per se. You were taught, you were conditioned to give away your power. And so this person starts walking all over you and it starts small and then it gets bigger, bigger, bigger. And before you know it, you got a giant hairy monster in front of you. But my patterns, because I was conditioned to give away my power, I have created this, so to speak. It's bigger than that, too, because it's not just the romantic relationship. It's also going to be who do they work for? Of they course. work for somebody who treats them like a doormat. They, Absolutely. Oh, what about the friend group? What are they going to be in the friend group? Are they going to be the leader? Or are they going to be the follower of somebody else? They're going to follow somebody else. They're going to you – no, know, it's going to it's yeah. going to infect every element yeah. of their life. And if we want to teach them all how to be not necessarily leaders but at least independent – Independent yeah. with independent thought, knowing where they want to go. I, I, yeah, and, and and I mean, you are you are God. You are you are uh, a, a, not just a counselor. You are a preacher. You're a badass preacher as well as a badass counselor. Um, I I I want to finish with this last point because what you said about sure. fixing, I think is a is a really and the only reason I'm finishing is because I'm just trying to be respectful of the time. Uh, uh, but this is amazing. You are amazing. I appreciate very very much how, how you ask uh, great questions you ask oh, great thank, questions thank you for that and and uh we'll do it again we'll do it again sure. um but uh when you talk about fixing a bunch of what you said about how we can relate to kids uh even the three things uh are also ways that we can relate to a significant other and one of the things that men obviously always 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 uh get 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 hit for in fact it's been it's been uh you know twisted around and mansplaining you think about things like that but the idea though is when we see a problem and there's a way to fix we want to fix when we don't intrinsically understand that that is not our role when listening when listening, our role should be for listening and not just waiting with a laundry list of things to retort with. And and so there's a video that's going around the internet right now, and I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it, it, it encapsulates this dynamic perfectly. And it's a woman with a nail in her head. Have you seen that? Have you seen the video with the woman in her nail head? Okay. It's very, very, uh, it's a very, very simple premise. Um, there's a woman and she's talking and you see her from here down. And she's just mm -hmm. saying, look, I just, I'm hurting right now. My head, it's hurting so badly. I just, I, I don't even know what to do. I wish I could do something about this, but it's, it's, it's like as blunt as fuck. It's, it's as blunt as you could possibly be. And then the camera pans up and the, the, the guy is sitting there listening to her. And then the camera pans up and she's got a nail sticking in her head. And he's like, well, why don't we just pull the nail out of the head? And she goes, I, you're not listening to me. And she, say, she starts going off about how he's not listening. And then she keeps talking about how she's got this nail in her head. Uh -huh. and, 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 and guys are like, but, but, and he's being kind about it, but he just mm -hmm. keeps saying, well, why don't we just take the nail out of the head? And I love looking at the male female dynamic as they watch that video because guys watch it and they're like, see, See, you just, that's all I'm trying to say. That's, that's where I'm coming from. But they don't see that equally women watch the video and go, see, that woman's not dying right now. Right. She's not, she's able to, she's not in a panic. It's not a, mm -hmm. it's not a, a situation where, where everything's going to, and, 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 and again, it's so cool watching men and women, and I'm generalizing mm -hmm. a lot, but, but these personality types watching this video and, mm -hmm. and, and still not getting that that's how the other sees it. And it's so right. obvious to them. Yeah. And, and it's just one of those it's things, learning how to listen. Yeah. It's a, it's well, a and, and, and just to expand on that point, uh, not that it needs it. You made a great point. Um, this notion of fixing, listening rather than fixing. And I guess yeah. sort of what I was taught is that um, you can have five tools in your tool belt, but a master craftsman has capacities to operate 25 different tools of equal fluency from the lathe to the belt sander to the jigsaw to the you know plane to the you know all these things and so if you see listening as a fix it's just another tool this oh. is ma this is master level shit it's That's just like it. anybody can go in and do the mechanical or the tangible side of it but it's a different it's master level shit That's where a man it. has so mastered himself and so mastered other abilities because the truth is even if you are a master craftsman with, you know, uh, you know, with woodworking, if you're now bringing metal in as a component, you don't have the skills and maybe you need to learn skills because there are going to be times such as where I'm sitting right now. You can see these beams up here are, are steel being uh, attaching wood beams, right? Well, you got to know how steel and wood interact and so forth. So it's, it's how men and women interact. And I, I, I want to share this one thought, and that is yeah. a very dear friend of mine. He had been sort of a – we coached together. I was an NCAA strength coach. He was the – he had been the men and, men's and women's soccer team 
coach at the beginning of the programs. They brought him in to do both. The programs grew. They offered him whichever one he wanted. He took the whims. He ended up getting his PhD at the University of Minnesota. His name is uh, Dr. Michael Navar. And he's, uh, he's still uh, is a professor and coach at Augsburg College, Augsburg University in Minneapolis. He did his doctoral thesis, and it was confirmed on a, by a, a PhD panel of, I believe it was five, and three of them were uh, professors, uh, female professors at the University of Minnesota, two male, I believe it was. And his fundamental thesis, he had done his own work as a graduate assistant under Anson Dorrance, with any, which anyone who knows uh, women's uh, college soccer knows that Anson Dorrance at North Carolina is one of the top programs in the country. Anyway, um, what Michael was trying to determine as a person who had coached men's and women's sports was what is the difference? Is there a fundamental difference between coaching female athletes versus coaching male athletes? Okay. He interviewed uh, whatever it was, 60 or however many um, NCAA coaches who were presently doing that divisions one, two and three. Mm -hmm. And so while he knew, you know, you're, you're still doing sort of case study stuff, but he wanted to at least do that sort of survey. And um what he determined, and his work was approved, but what he determined in his work is that uh, all of his work and uh, research boiled down to this. And he's, he doesn't offer it as an absolute. He doesn't say he has all the answers. He's just saying, this is, I'm reporting what I have seen. And it boils yeah. down to two simple sentences. When it comes to sports, but it applies, I've used this again in couples counseling, sex counseling, whatever it is. And it is fundamentally this. Women, a uh, female athlete needs to feel accepted before she'll perform a male athlete needs to perform before he feels accepted so if you're coaching female athletes you want to do massive team building and so on and so forth if you're coaching male athletes don't praise them unless he's earned it because you become a non-credible source if you've got little boys and you're just praising them and praising them all the time they're going to think you're a jack off and you're going to they're going to think oh mom's just trying to make me feel good it's bullshit i can't trust mom but i can trust dad even though dad's a fucking prick i can trust him because he doesn't get if i get a comment from him he means it. okay the point is who are you talking to so if you've got a male who my performance and i still and even sexually with me, it's just like, I still have to get out of my own head and I got to perform. I want to please her. And how did I do, honey? Shit like that. And I'm 50 fucking six, yeah. right? Yep. And then, and, but in the female, I'm in a relationship 10 years and she still needs to feel fucking accepted. So the bottom line is this, to your point, what you were talking about earlier, this notion of, you know, the nail in the head and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. The male watching that video can say, it's obvious. It's obvious. This is the solution. This is the solution, the solution. And you're right on one hand. But in the end, if you want to bond with the female sitting next to you watching this video, if you want to bond with her, if you want to make the sale, if you want to close the sale, if you and not just in a surface way, but if you actually want connection, doesn't yep. it make sense to begin to see it from how she sees it? And if you're the yes. woman in that, doesn't it make sense to begin to see it how they see it? And this is where the work of John Gray was really groundbreaking back in the 90s when yep. he did the whole Mars Venus stuff. Yep. And of course, you know, that's evolved. And, and he's, as with any great work, people have expounded on it and sure. tweaked it and added this and that. But yes, that is an excellent point. But it's so easy, especially with guys, this whole, I'm the fucking know-it-all. I know everything. I can't. And, and this is a big issue for guys. And, and since I'm on a guy show, I will say this. Guys, you fucking dumb motherfuckers, quit being the know-it-all fucking cunt that you are. If you can't learn to admit you're wrong, yep. and if you can't learn to fucking apologize, I can all but guarantee that your own children are going to fucking hate your guts. They may not ever say it to your face. They will fucking hate your guts, or they will distance them themselves from you later in life because you're so fucking annoying, but you got so much ego wrapped up in, I got to be right, and I never make mistakes, or I'm not going to, it's weak. To apologize which is the dumbest shit ever but you're doing that because of your own shit and how you were treated in childhood so grow the fuck up and heal your shit so that you can be a better parent and just doing the opposite of what your parents did that's not good parenting no. all right that's just doing the opposite you're yeah. still basing your parenting on the external power source that was your parent so not apologizing uh not admitting when you're wrong and just always doing the tough guy thing you are training your children to be so one-sided and one-sided athletes never do well guys on the construction site who are only good at one thing they're fucking worthless yep. until that one thing and then they're fucking worthless again it's just like expand your fucking tool set man and the way we do that is getting all my own shit out there that was never mine again begin with i was programmed to think all this shit about myself and i'm just trying to compensate it and it's taking a toll on the woman it's taking or partner if you're mm -hmm. gay and or it's and it's taking a massive toll on your own children 
dude, you got a great show here. I, I love the shit that you're doing. <laughs> you ask very incisive questions, deep questions, and uh, with significant comprehension. You've got massive success ahead of you. I don't, I don't doubt that even for one second. You just gave me goosebumps by saying that. I appreciate that. Um, um, and 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 uh, I want to put out what you're doing. I want to get that out there as well. If people want to connect with you, uh, badasscounseling.com, what's the best way? What's your Instagram and how do, how do people, um, your sure. books, latest book, sure. let's put that up again. Let's plug that. Let's talk sure. about that. Sure. What are the ways to get you, Sven? I'm, I'm actually, a, the major social media platforms that I'm on, my, uh, my girlfriend, she built an $80 million company in Manhattan um, and in the garment fashion and garment industry, 2,500 employees globally. So she has forced me wow to do shit that I lack the brain power to fucking do nonetheless, the experience and so forth. And uh, so I'm on Twitter, sure. Excuse me. I'm on TikTok, which was the genius stroke for her. And I've got millions of followers over there. And that's sort of where it all took off uh, yep. badass counseling on TikTok. And yep. there are about 50 fake accounts. Uh, TikTok is not quick to shut those down, but I yep. report them all, but it's the one with the most following uh, that's badass counseling there, badass counseling, on Instagram, Badass Counseling. On Facebook, on Facebook, there's also the Badass Counseling group for people who have read the book or are reading the book. There's a hole in my love cup. This is, I've written many, but this is the one. This is the bestseller. It's a bestseller now on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can get this. The simplest way to get it on audiobook. On audiobook, it's only available on my website, badasscounseling.com. It's available in all forms. Do e you read it? Paper. You better What's read that? it. You you read it, right? Yeah, you're stuck with me. I should have gotten no, a, good. No, I should have gotten a, a sexy it. sounding girl to read it. No, but you're stuck listening to my fucking jack off <laughs> voice. But the point is, you can get all forms of my book on the website, badasscounseling.com. Yeah. The audiobook, however, is only available there. I do not put it on Audible. I used to have it there, but Audible and Amazon in general have a long history of fucking over authors on royalties and shit. So it is not on Audible. You can only get it there. That's that one. But then I've had a new book come out since then, uh, Badass Wisdom which is a 366-day daily uh, inspirational, motivational uh, book uh, that'll kick your ass. We also have an audio book of that. Yes, that's my voice as well. Um, anyway, so those are available at badasscounseling.com, but I am on uh, YouTube. We've got a podcast also, The Badass Counseling Show. Yep. And uh, so anyway, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, it's all badass counseling, this or that. So just put that in and I come up. You're stuck with me. Sven, thank you so much. As he changes and expands and grows and whatnot, we would certainly love to link arms with you. Um, I'd love to. There, 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 with, I think you would agree with this. With the current uh, uh, the, the current temperature of what's going on in our culture right now, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people who are aimless. And one of the mm -hmm. things that they will aim to is a pole. And I think that that's what you are. You're a pole. You're a guy who who uh, is not afraid to stand up and 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 speak truth um, in times where there are a lot of people, a lot of guys who are afraid uh, mm -hmm. to 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 even uh, even look at what their truth is because there's so much shame out there and all that. And, and some of the topics that you have gone uh, over today that we just had to let fly by for the sake of time. Um, you know, I would love to get into some of those with you. So thank you so much for being the light that you are in this world. Thank you so much for, 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 for showing what strength is and, uh, and wanting to make this world a better place, starting with your own very, very clearly. Sven, thank you so much for coming on to HeCast today. Mike, thanks for having me on. And, and I'll say that, um, this is your show and you and, and your wife created this with a vision to change the world. I, I know that. And, this is the distinction, and this would be my last point, not for you because you're already doing it. This is the distinction between the men and the boys. This is the distinction between the bitches, and I don't mean women. I mean the men who are being bitches and the ones who are actually being men, as I see it. We got plenty of people bitching and complaining about how fucking bad the world is. Get off your fucking ass. Get in there. Get a vision. Do something. My dad what, tried to sneak into World War II at the age of 17. All right. That, and that greatest generation, my parents were that generation and they committed their lives to serving humanity in the ways that they felt called to serve humanity. Yeah. It wasn't, gee, I just want to get another boat and gee, I just want to fucking drink beer. on the weekend. And I'm all for drinking beer, bourbon in my case, and getting liquored up. I'm all for that. I'm not saying give that up. That's fucking stupid. Why would I do that? That doesn't even make sense. No, it said quit belly aching, as mom would say, and get to work. Don't talk about work ethic and kids nowadays don't have work ethic because you're conditioning them to just fucking bitch. Quit bitching, choose a path, and devote your life to making the world better. And that's what you're doing, Mike. And that's why I respect what you're doing because it's, it's, it's just fucking win or lose. I got to do something to make this world better. Mm -hmm. Like that old saying, if you're a plumber on the Titanic, 
well, what do I do? The ship's going down. You do what plumbers do. You start bailing water, you know, <laughs> just fucking get into the mix and make it a better world rather than con- fucking complaining. So I applaud you, Mike, for what you're doing and your wife as well. Mike drop. That has been another episode of he cast the official podcast of he changed it. He's Sven. I'm Mike. Go change something. <laughs>